I'm not a praying man, but if you're up there and you can hear me, show me the way. I'm at the end of my rope, right? George, will somebody take you home, huh? Strange, isn't it? Each man's life touches so many other lives. And when he isn't around, he leaves an awful hole, doesn't he? You see, George, you really had a wonderful life. Don't you see what a mistake it would be to throw it away? Please! I want to live again! I want to live again! I want to live again. Please, God, let me live again. Who's that? That's a Christmas present from a very dear friend of mine. Christmas. We're starting our Christmas series this morning. We call it Behold. And the word behold occurs so much more in older King James Bibles than it does in new translations. So if you look in your Bible, you won't find it a lot. But we decided that we like that word. And we want to use that word because behold captures something that no other word does. When you use the word properly, it means it's deep. It's powerful, it's startling, it's unusual. You have to pay attention to this. So, so you don't use the word behold lightly. I mean, you just don't. For example, I'm not in my kitchen. I'm not saying, honey, honey, wh where's the hot sauce? Behold, I have found it. <laughs> or you're m missing your keys and you've torn the house apart. Finally, she holds them up and goes, behold, the keys. That's not how we use it, but it may be more like this. Behold, you're not going to believe what's happening. You've got to see this. You've got to hear this. You can't miss this. This changes everything. Come here, quick. You have to see this. That's what the word behold means. And we say, behold, the baby has come. He's come. He's born. It fulfills prophecy. It confirms that God does what he says he will do. And in his life, the source of life, he answers every question we may ever have about what is our life about and how do we live. The source of life has come. Behold, he's here. And one thing I'm clear on when we consider the source of life is that we all long for a meaningful, purposeful life life. I'm certain of that. And so as we walk through this, this Behold series, I want you to be thinking that word and, and use it in your mind when you think of the things of God and the things of Christ and the things of what it means that he came and what Christmas is really about. So I want to unpack these words that we long for a meaningful life. What is long for? Long for means to desire with all your heart. It means Wishing with all that you've got, striving to, to achieve something or to attain something. It means you're hungry for it, you're thirsty for it, and, and it's similar to the word yearn, but yearn is deeper. Yearn says the longing is deeply embedded in you, that you can think of nothing else, that you have to have it, and striving means to make great efforts for it, scratching and clawing towards it, and I believe that every human is born Every human is born with this need to know that their life means something, that, that we, can, we can find a meaning and a purpose in how we live our life and whom we live our life for. 
So what have people longed for throughout history? And I did a, a kind of a search of this over time, and there's hundreds and hundreds of things on different lists. I picked some things that make sense to me for, for what we're doing here in our world today. And first that I found that people long for is peace on earth. Pastor Kevin mentioned it last week when he preached out of John 14, verse 27. When Jesus says, my peace I give you, not the peace the world gives, let your hearts not be troubled and do not be afraid. He's saying that if you have this peace, then that, that sense of peace inside isn't dependent on you getting this life situation fixed and there's no peace until then. He says it's enduring and deep and it covers everything. We long for that. We long for God's justice. I mean, I was driving here this morning. There was a guy on my bumper and I longed for God's justice for him. <laughs> I really wanted it. I don't know if it's longing, but I, I, I wanted it. It wasn't really deep and passionate, but I was thinking, justice for you. We want, but we want things to be fair. We want God to work everything out. We don't want bad guys to get away with stuff. We long for justice. We long for access to and a path to heaven. In some cultures, it might be paradise or that other place, but what, but what it really means about us in our heart is, I wanna know what that's about. I wanna get there. Is there a way to get there? And we long for it. There has to be more than this. We long for opportunity. If I could just get a shot, if the window could open briefly, if I could just have a chance, some opportunity to, to go for this or that thing, we long for opportunity. We long for love. We want to give and receive love. There's, there's a depth inside to that longing. It's deep, and God put it there. We want to give and exchange love and know what that's like. We long for freedom from constraints, from oppression, from, from all the things that don't allow us to be who we are and who God made us to be. We long for that. We long for solitude. Jesus went away to pray. Sometimes I just, I need the noise to stop. Can, can I shut things out? Can it just all stop? And I can have quiet and solitude. And that's kind of attached to something else we long for, which is rest. We long for rest. I, I just want to be at rest inside. I want to not have anything I have to do. Not have anything that's making me think. Nothing. I just want that, that rest inside. We long for prosperity. We want, we want more than what we have to often. You know, there's a research study done every couple of years at a New England university, and they found that when they survey Americans across this country, they ask them, how much more would you need to feel like you're prosperous or you're happy? And, they, and everyone says universally, pretty much close to this, 10% more than I have. Survey the same people in five years or six years, and they already have that 10% plus, and ask them, well, what about now? Well, about 10% more. We long for more. We want to be prosperous. We want to know that we're, we're achieving more, accumulating more, something we long for. And something else I ran across that we long for now, apparently. Apparently, we long for this. Great abs. <laughs> Watch. I want to show you. Psych. I'd never do that. Some of you are going, no! And great hair. Apparently, if you have great abs and great hair, you're there. I don't know how that works. In all seriousness, I do believe with all my heart that we, are, we each of us longs for a full and meaningful and an abundant life. I believe it with all my heart. I've been the psych guy on staff for a long time, and I'm, I'm a licensed psychotherapist and a pastor. And I can tell you what people have been telling me in counseling for many, many years, and there are questions that I've raised with others. Things like this, do I matter? Do I matter? That I'm even here, does it matter? What am I supposed to do with my life? What's my purpose? And how do I find meaning? This thing you're talking about, how do you find that? What gives you that deep satisfaction down in your soul? I need to know that. How do I know what God wants me to do? And if he does tell me, how do I do it? Or, or love, again. How do you find that? I feel like I'm all by myself all the time. How do you find all of this? And I want to unpack what this means when we say full, meaningful, and abundant life. Full means containing or holding as much as possible. It's complete. It's lacking nothing. And meaningful means relevant, significant, you know, valid, worthwhile. And, and 
Abundant means plentiful, rich, and ample, and lavish, and generous. So if you put them together, that's what this life looks like. It's, it's full, and it's rich, and it's deep, and it's meaningful, and it's valid, and it lacks nothing, and it's complete, and God promises that to us. I believe in our hearts we long for it. But what happens if we take him out of that whole equation? Say, I want to find you know, depth and meaning and purpose in my life. I don't want God to be in this thing. What happens then? Because it's hard for my mind to get around even having this, but he promises it. So what happens if we don't go after it the way we're designed to go after it? We have a design. There's a way we are designed by our creator to function. So that means when we follow Jesus in the way that we learn in scripture, that I can have that meaningful, abundant, and full life. I can have it. Jesus promises it. He says in, in John 10.10, 10, he tells the Pharisees he's the good shepherd and cares for his sheep so that we may live out all we're designed for. He says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. He's saying you need to know how distinct and different I am from anything you know about. I've come. I'm the source of life. Behold, I'm the source of life. Do as I direct, do as I coach, do as I show you, and you're gonna have this life to the fullest beyond your ability to comprehend it. If you do what you're designed to do, and we don't always do that, do we? We don't always follow the design. I mean, there's, there's things that we have in our life that are designed to use one way and we use a different way. And so it doesn't function the way it should. I think of my dad, my, my quirky, wacky dad. I never forget years ago going to visit him in Pomona. He had five cars in his driveway. Only one ran. He'd cannibalize the others to make the one run. And so he caught, we were in his house one time, and he goes, he'd do it like this, you know, he'd give me the inside scoop. He'd say, come here, come here, boy. I want to tell you something. Like there's spies all around, or paparazzi or something. He goes, come here. See that car in the driveway? Detroit maxed out when they made that car. And none of these other idiots know it. I do. I got five of them. Oh, yeah. I'm going to show you the car. True story. Who can tell me what it is? Gremlin. And his, the one that ran was factory purple. Just like your sweater right there. Exact same color. So we're in the house, and he's telling me something he wants to give me. It's this little lamp that's like a car or something. And I said, where is it, Dad? He goes, well, it's out in storage. I said, well, um, can you get it? Yeah, yeah it's right, right in storage. I said, well, where's your storage? Well, it's in the red one. It's in the red gremlin that's on blocks. He converted all four to storage. <laughs> they didn't run anymore. You put them on blocks, and it's a waste of space if you don't use them for storage. And he thought, this is ideal. And that was another part of what the people don't know. Cars that don't run make great storage. <laughs> so I, you, can you imagine the designers like Frank and Bob are in Detroit going, you know, they're shaping the clay like these guys doing the ads, right? <sighs> oh, yeah, gremlin. <laughs> and they're both two guys on the side of the car shaping the clay and going, yeah, the other thing about this car, it's going to break down really soon. It's great for storage. <laughs> That's not how it was designed. That's what we're like when we take God out. We're not operating as we're designed to operate. That's what happens when we take God out of the search. We have a, design, a divine design. If you got your pens out, fill in your words. A divine design for each one of us. And we learn in scripture, and it tells us that we were designed to serve, to help others, to seek the best for others. We were designed for it. We have to hear this. It's not just, well, it's something you can do if you feel like it. If you've received Jesus, the free gift of grace that you're saved by, you've said, I believe in the design. And so we're designed to serve, to help others, and we're designed to give. And Ephesians 2.10 just confirms our internal wiring. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works that God prepared in advance for us to do. 
It's part of the plan. It's part of the design. It's what it was designed for. A rocket ship is designed to go into space. We were designed to do this, and we were designed to give. It says in Luke 6, verse 38, a similar kind of a thing. It says, the power of giving is described. Give, and it will be given to you. That's part of your design. It will be given you, and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. He doesn't say it's going to be in a box somewhere out in the woods buried, and you got to go find it. I'm going to give it to you. So here's the thing. When we give... We receive. It's just built in, it says in his word. Now, you wouldn't, you wouldn't give so you can receive. Then it means your heart's not getting this right. But we're built to serve. We are built to give. And we were designed to love. In 1 John 4.19, we love because he first loved us. He first loved loved us. We're not wondering if we're loved. We're not wondering. I wonder if God loved me. I mean, he created me, but I don't know about the love part. I mean, Jesus saved me and I received it, but I don't know about the love part. We don't have that dilemma. We love because he first loved us. You know how it is like with puppies. You get a puppy, you know if you like the dog or not, but it's all over and it's thinking you're awesome and it's licking you and it's looking at you and it's saying, the sun sets on you, owner. Well, I'll give it a little love. Why not? Cats, not as much. <laughs> Except our cat. Our cat is basically a dog in cat skin. It doesn't work with fish either. I, I don't know why that is, but, but we don't have that question about whether we're loved or not. Not only are we loved, our design has given us the capacity to love. And I know it's more for some than others, but it is part of the design. God's word says that. He says in John 13, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. You know the context of John, this part of John, Jesus is getting ready to leave and the disciples are absolutely freaked out. They don't get the whole thing like, wait a minute, you've been with us? You've been teaching us? We, we watched you do miracles. We watched you confront the leadership. Uh, all of that and you're leaving. How can you be leaving? What, what's going on? And he's going, no, 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 no. I've coached you. He's saying, I've coached you. Look at me. You have to get this. I coached you. I showed you for a reason. Because if I stick around, everybody's going to follow me. How's that going to spread the gospel? But I'm going to bring the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, I coach you. He's saying, you're built to love. I showed you how to do it. Do that. Love the way I showed you. And guess what? The people you're loving will experience my love through you. I don't need to be here. I don't physically have to be here anymore. You've received. Now give it. So I'm still alive through you, is what he's saying. And we're built for it. We are built for this. So behold, behold, he offers what we long for. And the deepest parts of our being, behold, he offers it. And he gives us light and love. He, he says in Psalms, your love, Lord, this is so beautiful. It's poetic. I encourage you to go reflect on it again at home. Psalms 36, 5 through 9. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains. Your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. People and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O oh God, People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. Jesus brought light into the world. That baby being born in that manger brought light into a darkened, troubled, and broken world. And Christians don't live in the dark anymore. They do not. 
So Jesus said in John 8, 12, and he's at a festival when he says this. He says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now here's the scene. He's in the temple. It's a temple. It's an annual festival in the temple, festival of lights. And at the end of this festival is the highlight. People come far and wide to see this every year because there's four lights, one in each corner of the temple. And these lights are so bright that they light at the final, the final ceremony that it can be seen for miles around. And it was a highlight of his life as a little boy. And he's got his followers around him. And he's looking at the light. He's going, man, that's some light, isn't it? Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. And they're going, yeah. He's going, that ain't Nothing. Nothing. I'm the light. I'm the light now. That light's over. I am the light. What he's telling us is he's the light. He's the source of life. He's the headwaters. He's the fountain. He's all of these things. Day by day, we can live as we were designed to live. We can experience an incomprehensible fullness and joy because it's the fullness he gives us and the joy he gives us. I want you to unwrap, if you will think of it, unwrap this gift within you and allow yourself to live it out. If you're already doing that, praise God. Keep on keeping on. But if you're wondering, it's a great time to unwrap this gift, the source of life. And you know, for some people, it's easier. I'm a big fan of psych research, secular psych research, especially as it confirms truth found in scripture. And there's a study that came out recently that shows that many of us have certain things that we do that are intrinsic, meaning built in. They don't require discipline. They don't require reminders or anything. There are people who just give and serve others all the time. I just was with a bunch of them in Guatemala three weeks ago. It's just like breathing for them. But what if you're not one of those people? I'm not one of those people. I wished I was. Truth be told, I'm just not. So I'm in this other category. The research shows that if you do those things anyway that are serving and giving, even though they're not natural for you. They're called extrinsic. There's intrinsic and extrinsic. Here's what the research showed. If you commit to doing extrinsic behaviors, giving and serving, but those behaviors correspond with your internal core values, guess what? Over time, the extrinsic behaviors become intrinsic. They become part of you. God designed you. That means this works for everybody. Living out your design works for everybody. And I'm one of those guys that I gotta cough it up because it's not natural for me. I'm, I'm self-centered often. I, I wished I wasn't. But I, so I trust him. I'm gonna pray. And Lord, if you tell me I'm doing it because if I think just in my own thoughts, I'm in trouble. I really am. So that's how we can do it. Unwrapped and enjoy the gift you've been waiting for. So how do you know when you have an abundant life? I found this, this description in Christianity Today. It says, when we have shared our life with others, when we have enough of the blessings of God, mercy, peace, love, grace, and wisdom, to share with others and then actually do it, that's when we truly have abundant life. So what does it look like? What does it look like? I wanna show you a picture and talk about what abundant life looks like. I'm not gonna talk about the guy on the right. I'm gonna talk about the guy on the left. Just a few weeks ago, Pastor John Hausman and I were in Guatemala. This multinational organization called World Help invited us to go on a vision tour. They said, we want you to come as pastors, and, and there were other pastors from five states, 10 of us, to spend four and a half days with them, and they, they paid for me to go. I wasn't, I wasn't uh, able to go otherwise, and they paid for it. They said, we want you to see. And their partner in Guatemala, World Help's partner in Guatemala is an organization headed by this man. It's called Hope of Life. But it's not the organization so much as what happened in the man that struck me. If you know some of the Central America history, in Guatemala, there was a civil war from 1960 to 1996. And at one point after the war started, many young men, Carlos's age at the time, were approached and told, you're either with the rebels or the army, you better pick. And it was a devastating choice to have to make if you weren't sure. He and his brother said, we can't choose, so they left Guatemala. Came to America legally. And they were on a train to New York City to find out 
their fortune to find out what they would do, how they would make a life together. And they slept right through New York City on the train. And they woke up in Providence, Rhode Island, got off and went to work right away. Some years later, Carlos Vargas had become a wealthy man through just working 16 hours a day, seven days a week with his brother. And he got the dream home, and he got the dream bank account, and he got the prosperity we longed for, and he got all the things that should have all the meaning in all the world. And in that time, his mother's calling him from Guatemala saying, Carlos, are you ever going to come home and help your people? He said, well, America's my home now. Until he was diagnosed with a fatal illness. And the doctor said, your time is limited. And he goes, well, now what? Devastating news. So devastating, he said at the time, all he could think of is, I am so poor, all I have is money. You get the paradox in that statement. I'm so poor because all I have is money. He decided to come home and die. And he came home to the region of Zacapa, Guatemala, where we were. And he, he and his wife and a couple of his kids, he had some more later, occupied these two rooms in this place and he was just preparing to go because he thought it was just weeks away. And in the meantime, this blind beggar comes to him. He hears he's in town and says, can I borrow $10? Can you just give me $10? And he says, no, I earned this. I'm doing the American dream thing. And Jesus spoke to him. Carlos will tell you. He, he spoke to me. I didn't hear the words, but I, I got the message. He said, help this man. Help him. Okay. He says, and then, and I don't recommend you do this, he said, then I told God, I'll make a deal with you. Those are his exact words. It's in his bio. I said, God, I'll make a deal with you. If you let me live longer, I'll spend every day of my life serving you. Every day. That was in 1987. He was healed within weeks. Healed. And so he thought, I gotta honor my commitment. I'm gonna do it. I wanna live a different life. He bought an acre of land and he decided, I'm gonna build this place to take in the elderly because the elderly there often in the outlying regions are treated like castaways. They're just set aside and left to die. He goes, that's unacceptable. The Lord has put it on my heart to build this place. Then someone told him in a village nearby, there's the cry of a baby. And this baby is undernourished and it's not gonna make it if somebody doesn't do something. He said, I'm gonna go get the baby. We're gonna rescue that baby. And it began the baby rescue program. He had the elderly program. Then he bought a little more land, a little more land. And he just trusts in God every step of the way. God, what do you want? I'll do it. What do you want? I'll do it. As we visited and we stood there and Carlos spent uh, the better part of two days with us telling us the stories, Hope of Life now covers five square miles and has 500 employees. They have a six-level pediatric hospital for the kids in Guatemala that aren't gonna make it if they don't go get them. They have rescue homes for these babies to grow up. They move into orphanages of eight kids, a mom and a dad, eight kids, a mom and a dad, eight kids, a mom and a dad, every level of school. They have care facilities for children born with significant developmental disabilities. Significant, they can't make it in the world. Their bodies don't work right. They're not developing normally. And there's no help out there for them. They go and get them and they built a facility for them. We spent time with them held their little hands when they were small and just teased and, and had fun with the older ones as we prayed for him. He, he said, I'm never stopping. Why would I stop? How does it ever end? And you know, you'd think, well, yeah, but he has all that money. He could have a nice place on this property. He doesn't. He started building this dream home and it's halfway done out of block. It's now being converted to another ministry. He doesn't need it. He lives in two rooms. And his kids are up and working for the organization. And when you go into the giant palapa down in the main center of Hope of Life, where all the meals are held for teams that come and all that, it, you could probably seat 700 people there under it. It's massive. Over in the corner is a bistro table with two chairs around and a sign that says Carlos's office. <laughs> sure enough, the next day I go out there and there he is in his office. So you knock, hey, you just come in. <laughs> Hi. And he's there. Talk to anybody. He said, what do I need that home for? Somebody else needs that home. Somebody else needs that home. Here was a man who had the American dream. W wouldn't that dream give you meaning and purpose and an abundant, fulfilling life? Not for him. And I believe in my heart, not for anybody. 
God isn't in the center, if you're not following Jesus, I don't think you can have what he promises because he's the one that provides it. So when we consider Ephesians 2.8, it's by grace we're saved, not by works, lest no man should boast. There's nothing you can do to be saved. There's nothing you can do to create grace for yourself. All you do is get your heart in that, that submissive, vulnerable position and say, I receive you, Jesus. It's nothing you did. So what does that mean? It means you don't own yourselves. I don't own myself. We belong to God because it's by grace we're saved. We didn't do anything except receive a gift. So how can I withhold anything from him? On what grounds would I do that? I don't even decide what's right or wrong in the big picture. I don't. It's in his word. I, I, I don't live to please myself, even though in my selfishness I fight that. I live to please him. We live to become more like Jesus. We're made in his image. This is our motive. This is our guiding light. This is the purpose that gives powerful abundance and meaning to our lives. This is what this baby brought to us. And if you're wondering about your own life, ask those questions. How I give him my whole heart? I, I see so many selfless people serving in ministry. It's so humbling to me. Here and when I travel, it's so humbling to me but so inspirational also. And you know what? You don't have to wait for a Carlos moment. This isn't about a Carlos moment. Well, if I was near death and I had lots of money, I'd probably do that too. Don't ever go there. I just, I just wanted to show you one example of how it works. Because you can have nothing and have tons of money. You can have no money and have everything. You can have no money and live a rich, meaningful, deep and purposeful life. Jesus is the source of life. So ask yourself this morning, am I waiting for something? Am I waiting for a Carlos moment? I'm, I'm just gonna tell you, behold, the source of life has come. There's nothing to wait for. Do this in the privacy of your own heart. Ask yourself, Lord, where would you have me? How would you use me? I want that life. Speak into my life any way you want, any time you want. If you're already there, praise God. Keep going. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, Mary, <laughs> Christmas is so, so special to Christians. We love all the cultural holiday stuff. It's a lot of fun. No problem. But Lord, we drill down to the depth of meaning in Christmas, and we love saying, behold, because you have come, Jesus. And it's Merry Christmas for us, for sure. Speak to everyone in here this morning, Father. They are precious in your sight. You love them and you adore them, Father. Whatever they need to hear from you, would you speak in a way that they can receive with softened hearts and open minds and open arms and a willingness and an eagerness to do what you call them to do and do the same for me, Lord. I need that. Help us all, Father, as we behold the source of life who's come into the world, done what he came to do, and moved on and lives in every believer. We thank you for that precious gift. We pray these things, trust you for what you're gonna do. We thank you for what you've done, and we thank you in advance and confidence for what you're gonna do. We pray all of this in the precious name of the one who gave it all. And everyone here together said, amen. amen.